What is up, heroes? This is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, we finally made our way to the tower. Actually, I mean, a lot really went down. We met Bruno, who is supposedly the mechanic behind, um, I guess, the, the robotic villagers of St. Mystere. And we also had quite the confrontation with Don Paolo and Inspector uh, Chelmy. Well, rather, slash Inspector Chelmy. And we started, we, we actually completed the first puzzle of the tower. Uh, that will enable us to go up to the second floor. So, up to the second floor we will go. Wow, this is a pretty dark looking tower. So, we appear to have come up from that segment on the left, I, I believe. Like down here? Yeah, okay. So let's take a look around. Um, again, I'm not expecting very many puzzles to be hidden around here, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were at least a few. I also have no idea how big this tower is. Uh, it looks like, I guess from everything we've seen throughout the entirety of the game, there are going to be quite a few floors. Aw, oh, not another locked door. Whoever built this tower must enjoy watching people suffer. Well, my boy, are you just going to stand there and complain about it? <laughs> no! Leave this puzzle to me! Alright, Luke's on top of this one. Let's see what we got going on. A magic square. Is it truly a magic square? You need to solve this magic square in order to proceed. A magic square is a set of numbers organized... Okay, yeah, this is the same as that, that park puzzle. One and two have already been placed. <clears throat> Complete the rest of the square to open up the lock. Okay. So, if this is what I think it is, um, again, we're dealing with... This is, this is the Sudoku magic square. So each row, um, basically the sum of all of the individual tiles is 45, so our total number that each row, diagonal, etc. needs to add up to is going to be 15. And like I mentioned earlier, we're going to want a number that's clean in the middle. So let's go with 5 here, and then that would place 8 here. And like we I reasoned before, the even numbers need to be on the diagonal. So we're going to need a 4 and a 6 in the diagonal. Um, the question is which is going to go where. Uh, that 1 being there places that for us. So that's that. And then of course we need to have our odds um, placed as well. And we're done. <laughs> um, the, the vertical is 15. Horizontal, 15. Diagonals are, they're all 15. So I feel, feel pretty good about this one. This was the magic square I was a lot more familiar with from just Sudoku, but... Yes. Alright. <clears throat> Got that one all. Oh, magic squares have been around for thousands of years. The earliest record of a magic square dates back to 650 BC in ancient China. Wow. I got it. The door's open now. Good show, Luke. So, what was it you were asking me earlier? I'm all ears now. I wanted to know when Don Paulo snuck his way into the village. It seems like he followed us here. The only way into St. Mystere is through the drawbridge. Plus, I doubt Franco would let in such an obviously evil character as Don Paolo. <clears throat> yes, to be honest, I still haven't quite figured out how Don Paolo entered St. Mystere myself. But it seems that after he made his way in, he tried to stay at Beatrice's Inn. Oh, so that's the man who skipped out on his bill, of course. It figures it was Don Paolo. So that weasel did himself up to look like Inspector Chelmy, snuck into the mansion, and... Hold on, when did he kill Simon? <clears throat> we'll get to that in a moment. We must keep climbing. Come along. Interesting. Yeah, when did he kill Simon, right? It's pretty cool that uh, Layton's obviously able to put all of this together. And now we are on the third floor. Oh, it looks like we're climbing up the tower quite well. Oh, and it's our friend again! Our explorer who uh, seems to be quite lost. <clears throat> ah, konnichiwa, that's, that's something I like to say. Um, amigos. I'm so glad to see other people. I thought I'd be wandering this place forever. Hey, how did you get in here? Yeah, no kidding. There's no way you solved all those puzzles. <clears throat> um, I Oh, where did I hear the phrase? Je ne sais pas or something like that? I think it means I don't know. <laughs> I think it means I don't know. I think I heard it in like a... I think it was John Green who was talking about it on Vlogbrothers, regardless, um, with regards to double negatives or something. Anyways, it, <laughs> it just happened. Un momento. Um, or one moment, I'm wandering the sewers. The next thing I know, I'm here. I take it that this 
isn't the local hotspot my guidebook promised it would be. You have a guidebook? But then you also got here from the sewers? How curious. So where is it you'd like to go? If you go down these stairs, you can return to the village proper. Just make sure you don't fall into the large hole by the entrance. Ah, shit, shit. <laughs> okay, so now we've got Chinese as well. That should be enough information to get me there. But may I ask one more favor? All this talk of stairs has run me of a nazo. <laughs> I know, that's mystery in Japanese. Answer it for me, four, four, four. This is so funny. Absolutely hilarious. All right, take the stairs. You have business on the eighth floor of a 10-story building. It took you 48 seconds to make your way from the first floor to the fourth. If you keep moving at the same speed, how long will it take you to reach the eighth floor from the fourth floor? So, the, I guess the gut reaction is, oh, 48 seconds, right? <clears throat> And I'm trying to think of why it wouldn't be that. <laughs> um, if you go from the first floor to the second floor, the second to the third, third to fourth, you're climbing up three sets of stairs, right? In 48 seconds. So it costs, or the, the speed, right, is roughly 16 seconds per flight of stairs. So from the fourth, it would be one set of stairs up to the fifth, one more up to the sixth, one more up to the seventh, and then one more up to the eighth. Ah, I see, I see. Um, this is just kind of like the illusion of, um, being inclusive of your, your, like, first end point, I guess. Um, it's like how when people say, oh, if I have, starting from two, or if I start at the number three and then go to 17, how many do I have? People will say 14, but you have to include the number three, uh, so it's actually 15. Um, this is kind of taking advantage of that. So again, we climbed up three flights of stairs to get from the first floor to the fourth floor and that took 48 seconds so it's 16 seconds per flight of stairs however to get from the fourth floor to the eighth floor um it'll be four flights or is this just this is just a lot this is just simple arithmetic am i overthinking this i think so um but anyways four times 16 should be 64 so, I, um, yeah, I mean, how long will it take you to reach the 8th floor from the 4th floor? I think, I think 64 seconds is the way to go. Yeah, this isn't even actually as tricky as I thought it might be. It really is just that. Now watch me get it wrong. <laughs> I guess the tempting thing is to say, oh, the first through fourth, that's four, and the fourth through eighth, that's also four, but then you have to realize that the first um, doesn't count, I guess, in the same way, um, that it's like three flights and then four flights. So, yeah, we'll go with 64. There we go. All right. Critical thinking is the key to success. Three, five, five, five. Yep, that's the, uh, the tricky part. <clears throat> the guy's all sweaty. <laughs> I've done those before. There's like stair climbs. Those are tough. <laughs> Grazie. Now we now we have Italian. Uh, Italian has entered the chat room. Now I'm ready to go back to the village. What an interesting character. What a strange fellow. Professor, do you suppose that man is human? I believe so. He's an odd one, though, isn't he? I've never seen an explorer with such a poor sense of direction. Stranger still is how he entered Saint Mysterio. I don't think even he knows how he did it. Perhaps his presence yesterday was another reason why Bruno felt compelled to hide the crank. Yeah, I don't know if... I don't know if that guy is actually, like, relevant to the story, or is he more of a joke? Like, how did he end up at the top, or in this third... on the third floor of the tower after having been in the sewer? How did he get in the village after being... having been out? Does he wander through the air? Can he fly? You know? <laughs> All of these different things uh, seem rather... rather funny. Now, is there anything else for us to investigate? that we can find puzzle-wise out here. I'm not seeing anything immediately, uh, and it seems like we can go to the left, maybe? Is this stairwell, is that the stairwell down there? Oh, so there's a lot going on here. Oh, so we don't even have to go through, in order to get from floor three to floor four, we actually don't even need to solve a puzzle. 
I mean, I guess, theoretically, we solved that traveler's puzzle, but that question block there is definitely going to be the, the puzzle that we're intended to solve to make it up another floor. I guess both fortunately and unfortunately we're also not exploring a lot of these side rooms we see on the on the tower. It seems that we're faced with another puzzle puzzle lock, Luke. Oh, I meant to ask you, but our run-in with that explorer distracted me. How did Simon, you know... All in good time, my boy. First, we need to solve this puzzle here. It looks to be quite the challenge. Princess in a Box 1. Oh, so this is... There's a series <laughs> that is starting this late in the game. Tired of leading a sheltered life, this princess is trying to escape her castle. Armed guards, however, are blocking her path. Slide the blocks out of the way to move the red one out the exit to the right. Okay, her freedom depends on you. Can you do it? Okay, so the first thing we're gonna need to do is, um, is I think collapse those blue blocks. So what we're gonna want to do is move these green ones over. Can I move these even further? Oh no, I can't. Oh, so that that makes a difference. <clears throat> so I can only clear up one. I guess like column in front of the interesting <clears throat> meaning I can only really move the red block one column at a time <clears throat> because in the system as a whole there are only two individual squares I don't know my I need a drink of water <laughs> need a little sip there are only two individual squares available so that's all the leeway we're going to have. So how do we utilize that? <clears throat> okay, I definitely underestimated this at first glance. We can try to move one of the blue blocks. That's what comes to mind first. Is that if we do this, we can move that accordingly. We can then move the red block like this, and then we can move the blue block down, again, kind of working back the, past the mental barrier of, oh, blocks can move in any direction, not just the direction in which they're longest. Um, and now we have the freedom to move some of these green blocks. We definitely want to move this one here. The question is, do we move a second one? I think so. I think we move a second one here so that we can move this purple one up. And now our job is basically to, to cycle the rest of these blocks such that I can move the red block over bit by bit. However, however, as soon as I move the red block over, that ends. <laughs> because the, um, the blue block is on the left there. So then, is my move actually to try to cycle the blue block into the top right position? I think so. Let's see if we're able to do that. So if I move this all the way over here like so, and then move these down, this is probably more moves than necessary because I've kind of switched uh, strategies in the middle. But I think now that we've done that, we actually have the flexibility we need to get through this. So if we do that, then we can move this up here. Then I can move this over. Then this can come down, like so. Then I can move this over. Ooh, this is... This is tough. Maybe... Maybe that's not the case. Maybe that's not the way to go. Dang. I thought I was onto something. I guess I still think I am somewhat onto something. I think what I'll try to do... Mm, I can't really do that. I was going to say, I could try to move these green ones over so that I could shift the blue one up a bit, but doing so won't actually net me much freedom. 
I'm kind of stuck in this little network now. Yeah, I don't think that's it. I don't think that's it, unfortunately. I would have to undo some of what I did before, basically, in order to make enough space to actually move blocks meaningfully and basically undo a lot of the moves I had made earlier. Sadly. How about if I try to group the blue blocks together for now? Well, that doesn't really help much. Not a lot, at least. Um, I could try to cycle the red forward now. Like so. But that's not going to help either. <laughs> Is it? No, it's not. Dang. All right, we're going to restart. This is this is tough. This is tough. And like I said, I underestimated it. But it's uh, it's interesting. I mean, the tempting thing is to say, "Oh, just take the red and move it through the center towards the right." by clearing a path, but I don't think that's going to be the case. Instead, we're going to need to rotate it around the edges of this puzzle grid. And so we're going to have to constantly be rotating parts around it to clear up space for it to move. The question is, how do we want to do that? I'm trying to think of a good strategy. I don't want to just, you know, sort of trial and error my way into into these things. What immediately comes to mind is moving one of the blue blocks, right? So before what we did was this. So that I could move a blue block over and then start to move the red block. And then that leaves me with no choice, essentially, but to do this. And again, I would also want to do this so that I can afford to manipulate those, um, both of those spaces. Now I feel like... Let's see if I can do a nice little rotation here. where I kind of cycle this through, like so. I could utilize this to move forward, but that's not going to take me anywhere. Because after I would move the red to the right, I wouldn't have any more moves. Which is why, in the previous attempt, I thought it would be best for the top blue to be in the top right. Maybe it's that I need to reverse it. I need to have the bottom blue behind the red. Well, I mean, that'll definitely be the case in the end state. Yeah, so let's let's focus on doing that. Let's try and get one of the blues in the top right for now. And... Hmm, which one should that be for now? Let's try to move the lower right one somewhere. And I think I can do that if I utilize these guys. Wait, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done this. Hmm. Although I'm eventually going to get to a state where I can't move. Right? Yeah, I will. Do I somehow then need to cycle it up using this? 
where I then kind of bring this down and then can bring this over like that so I can bring this up then this up and then this like that is that what I'm supposed to be doing I mean to some degree it is making sense could move this over move this over but then I'm still not able to really bring it up I could bring this further up, though I don't think that actually accomplishes really much. What I could do is, um, if I move the red back there, I can try to cycle these greens through to create some space for the purple to move to the right. And in doing so, make some space for the blue to move up more. Let's, let's try to work with this for now. So now if I move the red down, I can move the blue to the left over again. And, and then what do I want to do? Well, then I want to keep cycling. I'm going to want to cycle the purple over as I move these green ones up to, to provide space for the red to start moving over and again I'm gonna have to oh but I'm gonna have to cycle the the purple over right I have to keep cycling this over but then it's gonna be near impossible to create enough space yeah dang <laughs> um Oh, I feel so close. It's almost like I need to have some sort of flow so that I can move greens behind the red. Hmm. What is the best way to go about this? from here. I feel like I'd have to do this and then work on this somehow. Like what if I did that and then brought this up And I created some sort of space in the middle here for this to go like that and then up there. Then I now have this to work with. But that's still not going to net me enough space. That's still not good enough. Darn, and here I am thinking I was getting creative. What would change that? Well... If the purple were like one to the right... <clears throat> and that can really only happen... If I'm able to cycle the blue down, but then the blue is stuck down there somewhere, so, <laughs> dang. Yeah, the way to do it would have to be to bring this down and then move this over again. so that I can bring this over.
Maybe I take this opportunity to do this. And then do that so I can bring start to bring these blue ones down and around. I think that will be helpful. Wait, no. Um, I need to keep bringing these guys around. Like this, so that I can consolidate the two spaces like so. And then I can bring this forward, and now what? Now I can bring this down so I can shift these down again. And then, as I do that, I can move these green guys over so that I can move the purple guy over. And then I have again made space so that I can slide this further to the right. And we are so close. So close. And there we have it. That'll do it. Wow. So we eventually got it. We eventually got it. Um, we took a long time and way more moves than necessary. But again, that was just be kind of because we were kind of evolving creating different strategies as we went and rather than necessarily restarting uh you know going through it but this is a classic example of a sliding puzzle um but that was that was really cool you really had to think about what what type of piece needed mobility where in order to move other pieces and how you could kind of cycle pieces through that was that was a great puzzle <laughs> that's a great puzzle is what that was there we are the door should open now amazing as always professor now about Simon, what exactly happened in the mansion? I don't remember the exact details of everything leading up to it, admittedly. It's like we were all chatting, then we went out to explore. I don't remember. Did Don Paulo really murd, um, make off with Simon? I'd say so. This is just my theory, mind you, but I think that Don Paulo followed us into the manor. That's when he met Simon, or came across him, as the case may be. I suspect Simon had already collapsed when Don Paulo found his body sprawled, sprawled on the floor. Just like with Raymond. So maybe Simon had also stopped functioning properly, huh? Yeah. And then he utilized that as an opportunity? I guess all the robots break down sooner or later, and when they do, Bruno comes to collect them. Then he fixes them here in the basement of the tower. Oh, do you suppose the noises from the tower are actually the sounds of Bruno's machines working? Yep. I think you're spot on, Luke. That must be why people began to associate the disappearances with the roaring from the tower. Don't forget that, despite his peculiar appearance, Don Paolo is a scientific genius. Therefore, he probably realized why Simon had stopped moving. If it weren't for the golden apple, Don Paolo likely would have left St. Mysterio right then. I'm sure he was eager to take the robot apart and learn how it worked. And that must be when he decided to disguise himself as Inspector Chelney, right? That rat made up the whole murder story on the spot. But that's not the whole mystery. Come, Luke, we must keep going. I'll explain the rest as we go. Ooh, I'm so excited. This story is so good. And so that covers the uh, the Rumbling Tower and Raymond mysteries. We still only have Lady Dahlia, the noise, and the Golden Apple. Holy cow, we're getting so close to solving all of this game's mysteries. Absolutely crazy. All right, um... With that said, let's keep on climbing. Oh, and it's this lady again! <laughs> With her deck of cards, I'm sure. Or her standard probability problems. Hehehe, <laughs> fancy meeting you here, dearie. How'd you like to try a little puzzle I made up? How on earth did she get up here? Hmm, she must have overtaken us at some point. Funny, I didn't even see the old girl pass us. <laughs> Quit whispering amongst your shelves and try out my puzzle already. It should hum... a humdinger. <laughs> humdinger? Humdinger? Can't say I've ever heard of that, but card order. 70 pick rats. Wow. <clears throat> okay, you've placed one joker and four aces. <laughs> Seems to be a uh, trend. With different suits face down on a table. Use the hints below to determine the position for each card. Okay. The club is the immediate is to the immediate right of the heart. Okay, so going from left to right, we know we're going to have heart and then club. Neither the diamond nor the joker is next to the spade. Okay. So next to the spade can only be 
well, I guess the heart club, heart or club, right? And there are going to be two cards that only have one card next to them, which is, which is also worth noting. Three, neither the joker nor the diamond is next to the club. Okay, um, and we, again, we know that the club is immediately to the right of the heart. So the heart is going to be on the left side of the club, and on the right side of the club, it will not be the joker or the diamond. Which means it's the spade. Right? <clears throat> so, right off the bat, we know that the club has to be one of the three middle cards. We know that the heart is to the left of it, and because, well, when we think about what could be to the right of it, it's not the heart. And then number three tells us it's not the joker or the diamond. And it is the club, so we know that it has to be spade. So working from left to right, somewhere we have heart, club, spade. Now four, neither the diamond nor the spade is next to the heart. So again, the heart on its right has the club. And on its left, it cannot be the diamond or the spade. So if it's not the diamond, it's not the spade, the club is to the right, it has to be the joker. If there is a card to the left of it, <laughs> which is of course worth noting. So what I'm currently seeing is, is joker, heart, club, and then did we say spade? Spade and diamond. That's what I'm seeing at the moment. Let's see if this fits our, uh, our rules. The club is to the immediate right of the heart. That is true. Neither the diamond nor the joker is next to the spade. Oh, but this case has the diamond next to the spade. So, what I would presume then is we could actually just shift this all to the right one. Okay. So again, the club is still immediately to the right of the heart. The Neither the diamond nor the joker is next to the spade. That's true. Neither the joker nor the diamond is next to the club. That's also true. And neither the diamond nor the spade is next to the heart. That's true. So I think this is our order, actually. Yeah, I mean, I don't see any contradictions with any of those statements. Neither the diamond nor the spade is next to the heart. Right? Yeah. All right, let's submit it then. That should do it. While doing that, grab a little bit of water. Every puzzle has All right. Answer. That was a pretty cool one. Only a strong grasp of the principles of logic can get you through a puzzle like this. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you, late. Oh, yes. That's the answer, all right. Well, then I guess I'll be off. Come visit me sometime. Him, him, him. I guess she followed us in here. We're not getting any furniture. I am I am a little bit concerned, admittedly, <laughs> about the fact that uh, we're really coming up on the end of the game and we haven't solved the the happiness of these individuals with their rooms. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe think on this a little bit. Because I don't want to miss out on something because we didn't optimize that, for example. And is there anything else of interest in here? Hint coin. But otherwise, no hidden puzzles? Doesn't seem so. Alright, then we'll continue forward. We are now on the sixth floor. And again, looking at the top screen's map, uh, we still have quite a bit to go. Um, there's a hint coin. Lovely. And is there anything else? Any other hidden puzzles here? No? Looks like we still have at least a couple more floors to go. We have solved 111 puzzles, so we're making good progress. We probably only have nine more to go. Let's see what we have here, though. This looks like it'll be another tough one. Just like I thought. There's another puzzle locking this door. It looks really difficult, Professor. Luke, my boy, haven't you learned by now? No puzzle is without an answer. Now, we simply need to find that answer. Here, allow me. Ooh, I, I appreciate those encouraging words, Layton. Three, 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 exclamation point. Huh. And a 70 pick rats. Okay, use each of the numbers, one through nine, exactly once to fill in the blanks and complete this equation. Ooh. This is really cool. Um, 
So, so how do we want to think about this? How do we want to think about this? So I want to start off with the 10,000 digit in the, the number, um, the top number, the bigger number. We're subtracting something that's in the thousands and our end product is in the, well, is 33,333. So because we can only subtract 9,900 or well, 9,876 as our maximum number, the highest that top number can be or I guess even if you want to consider it the lowest it could be, or no, the highest that number could be, um, well, you could put, I guess what I'm trying to say is the 10,000s digit has to be a four. <laughs> um, a four or a three for that matter. Because you could have 40,000 something minus up to 9,000 something, um, that would lead into the 33,000s, or you could have something in the high 30,000s minus something smaller than, per se, um, like six or, or five or 6,000, which would keep you within the 30,000s. So we know that this 10,000s digit here has to be a four or a three. I should write this down, actually. Okay. Um, just so I don't forget. This has to be a four or a three. So we can't use those elsewhere. Now, what else? Um, there's an interesting set of, I guess, combinations. Um, if we cannot use either four or three, does that help us limit other things? Mm, well, we need to know which one it is, really. <laughs> so, we need to think of a couple things. Um, in the large number, like the thousands digit, for example, if the 10,000 digit number is a four, and we're supposed to end up with a three in our thousands digit, we're gonna want something that's low, um, and then the thousands digit in, I guess what we're subtracting from the larger number uh, would want to be high. So for example, if we had a two in the thousands digit of the big number, we would need to have a nine as the thousands digit number. And similarly, if it were one on top, we would need an eight on bottom. And we couldn't have a three there if the ten thousands digit is a four. Because if we have 43,000, there's no way we could subtract 9,000 and, and get there. Or rather, um, there's no number that when we subtract it from the thousands digit, it would end up with a three in our thousands digit for the answer. So we know that that second digit, if the first digit, if the ten thousands place is a four, the thousands cannot be a three. Is that really helpful? Well, it means it would have to be a one or a two. Right? And that is somewhat helpful. Hmm. This is pretty tough to, to logic your way through, admittedly. So let's say if if four, then this has to be a one or a two, um, the thousands digit in the bigger number. And if that's the case, then the thousands digit of the smaller number needs to be eight or nine, respectively. And with that, we've already started to eliminate some of the options for our other numbers. Because we can only have, I guess, two sets of like one or two on top and then the nine or eight on bottom. Oh yeah, that's interesting. So, so we're gonna basically have one number that stands alone and then we're gonna have four pairs of numbers that when, um, I guess, yeah, that when subtracted will give you three. Hmm. So we need four of those pairs, right? And what's tempting is to say, oh, you could just have like 
1 and 4, or 2 and 5, or 3 and 6, or 4 and 7, or 5 and 8, or 6 and 9, which is 6 total pairs, right? We need to narrow that down to 4. And I guess there's more than 6 because you could have a larger number or a smaller digit on top that would then be, you'd be subtracting a larger number from it, or a larger digit from it below to get 3. And that was what we were mentioning before, where it's like one on top and then eight on bottom, or two on top and then nine on bottom. So in total, we have eight potential pairs. And we need to narrow that down to four. And again, that first digit in the ten thousands number um, needs to be either a four or a three. So, I wonder if there's really only one solution. Hmm. I wonder. We'll keep thinking about it. <laughs> we'll keep thinking. So, if the top number is a 4, then our we have our pairs where two of those pairs need to be... Or do they need to be the 1 and 8 or the 2 and 9? They don't technically need to be, right? Although, again, the maximum that that number on the bottom could be is 9,876. Right? And that's, I mean, assuming we use all four of those numbers like so. Um, it actually couldn't even be 9,876 because 7 and 6 wouldn't have valid top numbers that would give rise to a, a product of 3, or a difference of 3 in that particular digit's column. So it actually couldn't be that. Um, it would have to be even lower. It would have to be like 9,843, I think. But I guess basically to just get an upper limit on our our big number, it would have to be 3,333 plus 9,876, although it's probably, again, still 43. Yeah. Actually I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the 43, because it, it definitely cannot be 76. So if we add those together, what do we get? We get um, 1,200 plus um, 1100, or no, we get 12,000 plus 1100 plus 76. So 13,076, right? Oh, I'm missing a three. <laughs> it's 33,333 plus the 9,843. So we're talking like 42,000 plus the 1100, so 4,300 plus 76. So 4,300, or 43,076 would be the max. But again, we can't even use zero as a digit. Oh, or no, it's 43,176. Sorry, I'm trying to do this in my head. Um, that would be our, our maximum number, 43,176. And we cannot have 3 as that second number, so that can't even be the case. So, the maximum number would then have to be, what, like 42,176? Again, that would make our difference, though. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. There's definitely a restriction on how many of which type of match we can use, right? I told you there was one match where it's like, oh, the lower number is on top and the bigger number is on bottom. I'm pretty sure we can only use one of those. Hmm.
Although, could this just be... Could it be easier to construct this? Just by saying something like... I guess... What's keeping you from doing something like... Just saying... <laughs> I see what's keeping me from doing that. If I use three in the beginning, I can't use it. I can't use six. So three can't be the 10,000th digit. Because six would then have to be used in one of the other two pairs, but six is only available with, well, no, actually I could use nine and six, right? But then I'm left with seven and eight. And those are not compatible. Interesting. Um, so, so one thing that I'm seeing, right? If I choose three as my ten thousands digit, the number six is actually really important because the only pairs it can be involved with are nine and three. Nothing else will give rise to um, a difference that has a digit of three, right? You could have six on top and a three on bottom, or you could have a nine on top or a six on bottom. However, if three is the 10,000 digit, we obviously don't have access to the six on top and three on bottom. We only have the nine on top and six on bottom. Where does that become problematic? Well, what limitations does that place on the others, right? Four and one are fine. Five and two are fine for now, but we're left with this seven and eight, which is problematic. So I have to ask myself, could I rearrange the remaining four digits that are not locked per se, the four, five, one, and two, such that seven and eight fit? And I don't think so, because two cannot be used on the top, right? Because if it were, we would need nine. So two needs to be on the bottom, meaning five needs to be on the top. So five and two are actually locked as well. So between four, one, and seven, and eight, could we do that? Well, if we rearrange them, I think we can. Because we could have one on top and eight on bottom, and then seven on top and four on bottom. And I think that works. <clears throat> or no, it doesn't because the one is gonna carry. <clears throat> Yeah, the one is going to carry, won't it? Yeah. So this doesn't work. But that was the only way we could have attempted to construct such a thing, because the 4 and 7 are locked into this space, the 5 and 2 are such, and 8 and 1 could only work in this manner, but this isn't true. Um, it's actually going to be just off, right? It'll equal 30,300, um, or 33,323, not 33. So, what we can determine from that is that it's not three in the ten thousands digit, and instead it must be four. Because again, we couldn't have a five or anything like that given the maximum number we can actually subtract. So that must be a four. Now, what other pairs is four used in? Only four and seven and four and one, right? So we have a restriction on what one can be used with, for example, because one is only used with one other pair, and it's the eight one pair, meaning one must be on the top somewhere. So one must be in the top row, and it's got to be with eight. And then seven also does not have four. Can, be, can seven be paired with any other number? No. Hmm. So that's making me skeptical of my logic. <laughs> because where in the world would seven go? The only thing I can think of is it would have to be the, the carried over, right? 
Um, seven would have to be with not four, but three. Seven would have to be with three, and whatever number is to the right of it needs to carry one over. And that would alleviate that problem. That also opens a whole nother Pandora's box. <laughs> um, honestly. But now we've used the one and the eight, and we should be able to make, with the, the remaining pairs, a comfortable number. So let's see here. Oh no, that doesn't work. <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, because... Because the the one that carries over, if four is in the ten thousands digit, we need to have something that carries over next to it, right? Yeah. Then that second we said that earlier. That second digit needs to be a that thousands digit in the top number needs to be a one or a two. So, we've locked potentially nothing. <laughs> or rather, the 7 has to be with the 3, but then there has to be a number to the right of it that works like that. Mm, can we do 9 and 2? But no, then we're left with 6 and 5, and that doesn't work. Right? Basically what I'm saying is, if we have a 4, then we need to have a 1 or a 2. Um, and what we were saying before is that it would have to be the, the 1 and the 8. Because the 1 can only be paired with the 8. Or it could be paired with 7 if we carry 1 over, right? Because the 7 and the 3 also need to have 1 carried over. So what if, what if we put the 7 here, and then had another pair that, that carries one over? That would have to be the 2 and the 9, right? Right? Yeah. That would have to be the case, but then we're left with 8, 3, 5, and 6. We could try the 8, 5, and then the 6 and the 3, and see how that goes. Is that correct? This may... I think this works. Yeah, so... So let's... I mean, if we do this, right? 7,953 is basically... 8,000 minus 47. So if we were to subtract 8,000 from 41, 286, what do we get? We get 33, 286. And then if we add the 47 back, yeah, we get 33, 333. Three, three. So I think this is it. And the big, the big stepping stones in the logic were that if the first number, the first number or the 10,000s digit can either, can only be a four or three, and we see that if there's a three, we can't actually utilize the other pairs as needed. And then we, so we know it's a four, but if it's a four, that digit to the right needs to be a one or a two. And if it's a one, um, I guess there's also, each digit can be paired with a number that's three away from it, but it can be four away if a one is carried over from the pair to the right of it. Knowing that um, this one on the right has to be a one or a two, we then know that the that has to be a uh, seven, eight, or nine, really, in the thousands digit of the the bottom number. But and then we can work through it from there. But wow, that was um. I well, I shouldn't talk like I'm done. I'm pretty sure this is it. That should do it. Wow. Okay. So yeah, we have it confirmed. Another puzzle solved. That was. That was a tough one, but that was a cool one. There are two correct configurations. Did you manage to figure out both? <laughs> no, we did not. Um, however, I'm pretty sure you could actually uh, switch the 9, 7, and 8, and 1 and 2 around. But creativity and persistence, Luke. As long as you have these, no puzzle is beyond your reach. Professor, I was just thinking. 
Do you remember that picture we found in Lady Dahlia's room? The one of the Baron's late wife, Violet, holding a child who appears to be the young Flora? Of course. That's the one. It's uncanny how much Lady Violet looked like Lady Dahlia. Do you suppose Baron Reinhold's journal entries were talking about Lady Dahlia? Sharp thinking, my boy. I believe it went something like this. The craftsmanship of it is simply remarkable. It reminds me of my sweet Violet when she was alive. That's the one that tipped me off. Professor, do you suppose Lady Dahlia is actually a robot built to resemble Lady Violet? Precisely. That's entirely possible, maybe even probable, given the circumstances. But if so, what a terribly sad story these entries tell. Do you remember what the next entry said? Flora doesn't like the thing at all. I've seen her run away from it on multiple occasions. Recently, she spends more time playing by dear Violet's grave than anywhere else. I'm sad to say, but I doubt Flora will ever take to it. I can't blame her, as I've changed its memory. I felt terrible forcing that change on Flora, but I just couldn't bear to see it like that anymore. Violet, there can never be another you. You were my first, my last, and my only. Ah, uh, the memory change must refer to the, um, I guess, saying that Flora is not actually her daughter. So that Dahlia isn't actually, well, doesn't have Violet's memories, perceive Flora as her daughter, and then, you know, be dreadfully hurt by the rejection and so then change the memory so that Flora is not perceived as her daughter anymore, and, and so forth. But we saw somewhat of a regression of that, um, that earlier. The Baron arranged for the construction of a robot for Flora that was identical to his late wife, but living with a machine that was so similar to his wife must have been too much for him. Thus he decided to change the robot's personality, and so Lady Dahlia was created. Interesting. As she was originally created as a mother figure, she must have gone through a confusing transition. Hmm, Professor, do you suppose these robots feel sadness? Whoa. Whoa, now we're getting real deep. Honestly, I'm not quite sure. But I have a feeling that each of these robots has something not unlike a human heart. What do you think? I... I hope that they do. Wow. Cool puzzle, really touching moment afterwards, too. Lady Dahlia's mystery is solved. Now it's just, just the noise and the golden apple. Wow. We are... We are quickly climbing and approaching the final secrets this game has to offer. This is actually quite remarkable, um, truly remarkable. And I hope you guys have enjoyed um, trying to solve these puzzles yourselves, potentially, or at least hearing my process, and hearing so many of the mysteries of this game be put together. It's been really fun to, to hear it all and to see Leighton and Luke put it together as we've been trying to do ourselves throughout the entirety of the game. And. I hope you guys are looking forward to more, but until the next episode, this is Movie Night Zero, and this mission is complete.